and he will lift you up, and he will lift you up. Be seated. Well, about half the congregation just left, so uh, you all are here. That's good. I have somebody to talk to. Uh, what a blessing, though. I, I know we have a couple of families who aren't here, and oh, so good to see the kids and hear the kids. It's wonderful. Good energy. So uh, we are actually finishing up our, woo, our series today, uh, going through the book of 1 Peter. Uh, we've been looking at this letter that Peter wrote. Uh, to a group of individuals who are in modern-day Turkey, uh, new churches, new Christians who are facing some difficulties. And he has spent this letter, these five chapters, kind of talking about, yes, uh, you are going to face some difficulty. Here's some ways to act when you face difficulty. And always remember that Jesus Christ also faced suffering, persecution, and difficulty. He was an example for us, but he also gives us a living hope. It's somebody or something else. And so we have had a me problem in our world ever since men and women walked on the face of the earth. Today, obviously, it's manifested itself in a little different ways. I kind of just love this little document, social me, the us. All these little clouds with all the various apps and all that. And I'm not saying social media is horrible or wrong or inherently bad, but it has contributed to some of the introspective me-isms of our world today. And so Peter, in his final exhortation, is going to say, no, it is not about me, as much as I wish it was about me, although I don't know if I'd want all of that focus on me. But Peter wants to close his letter with an emphasis on humility. Much of these last couple of chapters we've gone through, he has talked about how we as Christ followers are to live in a fallen world. I am constantly reminded that I am a flawed individual living in a fallen world. Peter has given us specifics, different situations we may face, and how God would want us to act in those. One thing, as a flawed person in this world, I am also reminded I do not deserve God's grace. But Peter, throughout this letter, reminds us, and he will end his letter reminding us again, that because of what Jesus has done, there is hope. And so, if you have your Bibles, would you please turn? You'll actually find today's text on page 589. If you don't own a Bible, please take that home. That's a gift from us to you. So starting at verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, 
casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now, I know it's really late, but I just want to continue to focus on who our author is, because it's going to be really important as we look at this text, especially with regards to humility. So I want you to think just about some experience you've had, some place you've been that constantly brings back memories in your life. For me, there was this area in Northern California. It's called the uh, Trinity Wilderness. And I used to take groups of uh, friends up there for about 15 straight years. We would go up in October or November. Fall colors were churning. We would go and we would fish at this beautiful lake. And I just have these thoughts and these memories and these feelings that whenever I see a picture of that area like this, I just remember the smells. So we used to have steelhead and salmon that would go up the Trinity River to this area, and some of them didn't make it. And even though it wasn't the best smell, smelling rotting fish, it reminded me of what was going on there in this beautiful place. And I brought many friends up there, some who had never fished before in their lives, and they caught their first fish on this trip. Some of the food we made, watching the smoke just kind of drift across the lake. There was no wind to blow it out. It just stayed there and just those images. But think about Peter, and not all memories obviously bring up wonderful thoughts. Think about Peter, especially the end of his life. Peter, who was so prideful that he said, no way, if everybody else falls away from you and denies you, I would never, ever do that. And then he did. And think about the memory that every time he heard a rooster, and he lived in a farming and fishing community, every time he heard a rooster, he would remember that he denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. And so as he reminds us of humility and what it's like as he finishes out his letter for us to live in a Christ-like manner, remember, this is a man who experienced probably the lowest point that any of us would experience, denying his Savior Jesus, his good friend Jesus. But remember, like we talked about last week, he was reinstated, he was forgiven, and that is offered to all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that Peter is an example for us of a flawed human being who is used by you in powerful ways and shows us that restoration is possible. Thank you for these reminders of humility in times of difficulty that we know, I know from experience, pride can just get in the way and can just sidetrack things, and may we be a people focused on serving and on looking to you for wisdom, for guidance, and to take our anxieties, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So back to verse 5. So he throws in likewise. That's been a tool that he's been using often, and he has just talked about how a proper elder, and we've just uh, appointed five of those, how they are to act. And one way that they are to act is to not be domineering, but to be humble. And so he says, okay, so the rest of you, and he uses the word younger there, and it really kind of trips some people up because we just assume that he's talking about 
you know, the older people in your congregation and the, just the younger ones. But he's using the word younger here, and most translations and most commentators would say, meaning the rest of us. Those of us who are not in a position of eldership, that we are to be subject to them. And subject, subjection, being subject to someone, this is not a new concept, if you remember. Peter has brought up that type of idea in numerous situations that he has pointed out as he's talked about how we are to live. And so we have just gone through a process, as Aaron mentioned, took us many weeks to come to a point to commit these five elders to the next five years of service. They will be serving humbly. They will be subject to God. At times that may require all of us in this church to be humble, to kind of put our thoughts and desires aside for the betterment of God's church. And so, then he shifts quickly to an everyone again. And here there's no doubt, because he says, all of you. And he uses this interesting term, clothe yourself. It isn't used very often in scripture, but what it means is, as in a, like a blacksmith putting on an apron to protect his garments, or a shepherd wearing an apron, maybe it's time to shear the sheep or whatever, to protect what is behind that apron. And so, clothe yourself, put on that apron, put on that suit over you to protect and show true humility. Humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. I want to put on that clothing, whether it's the Holy Spirit's gifts, the Holy Spirit's fruit of the Spirit, whatever it is to show what a Christ-like individual should be, because I know beyond that clothing is this fallen, fleshly, sinful human being. And Peter is saying, do your best by putting on the Holy Spirit to not allow that part of you to be what others see. Be humble. And of course, Peter is remembering Jesus, who said on a number of different times when he talks about humility, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And remember, Peter had a couple of experiences where he exalted himself, even if those other 11 deny you, I will not. I will die with you. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And continuing on, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. He may lift you up. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Once again, this is a phrase that is found no other place in the New Testament, this mighty hand of God. It's an Old Testament reference, specifically to when God brought the Israelites out of slavery, out of Egypt. And so the imagery here that Peter is trying to give us is the mighty hand of God also helped us come out of the old life, helped us work through the difficult situations we're in. The most powerful being in the world is our God and our Father. His hand is mightier than anything Satan and his demons can throw at us. And so, humble ourselves, follow God, God will take care of us, is pretty much what verse 6 says. And then something that Jesus taught about quite often, and then cast, literally throw on to, Jesus, the Spirit, God, your anxieties, because he cares for you. Literally, trust, that word cast there is to trust someone with what you're going through. Trust someone with your anxiousness. Trust someone with your suffering. Trust someone with these things that, as they're difficult to go through, can also serve as a distraction. And then, one of the reasons why we cast our anxiety, anxieties onto God is so that we can be sober-minded and watchful. Sober-minded and watchful. This is a brilliant statement. Because if I cast my anxieties, my worries onto God, that frees me up to be sober-minded and watchful for when the enemy tries to attack. Friday, I don't know how Fridays are 
for you all, but you know, you're, you're trying to plug through it, you're trying to work through it, and I was doing some studying and some reading. Early in the morning, I read a few, ver or a few pages, and I just immediately kind of woke up and thought, what did I just read? Am I even paying attention? What is going on? What is this fog I'm in? In the afternoon, same thing. So I had some Yerba Mate tea, has a little more caffeine. Maybe that'll be the jolt. Even took a sip of five-hour energy drink. Nothing. It's like four o'clock, and this is dangerous for me if I have more caffeine, but I had to have some coffee because there was stuff I wanted to study and read. And that finally helped me be a little more watchful literally watching the words and understanding them that were on the page. That was, I was going through this spiritual drowsiness. And it reminded me, and I, there was a lot of illustrations as I went through Peter's uh, teaching here that came to mind. And one is, uh, I, I've, as I've mentioned, I've climbed Mount Whitney three times, three and seven, eight, almost made it to the top a fourth time. It's a pretty difficult climb, but one thing about Mount Whitney, especially if you do it in June, which is right after the roads open, you really have to be watchful, sober-minded, aware. Because as you can see, when we went up in June, the picture on the left, we still had to go across snow and ice. And this is a 26-mile hike, okay? So you're weary, you're tired, you're worn out, and you had to go through some technical sections. There was even one point where we went through the snow and ice and got the family through. I slipped and cut myself on a rock, which is not something you mentally want to think about when you're 10 miles away from help. Thankfully, it was a, a cut that went, you know, stopped bleeding after 10 or 15 minutes, so I didn't have to really worry about it. And then, once you get to the crest, and these pictures don't do it justice, but you have these openings. Your trail's about this wide, and there are certain places where you have a 2,000-foot drop-off on either side. If you don't have your wits about you, if you are not sober-minded, if you are not watchful and paying attention, not only am I no good to those people I am with, it could actually literally lead to death. And that's what Peter is reminding us of. Be sober-minded because we have this adversary, this lion that prowls around seeking someone to devour seeking someone to devour. So think about Peter's original audience in the time that they exist hearing this particular illustration. Would this be something that at least through stories is fresh and real physically for them? As Christians are being put in the ring at the Colosseum, where roaring lions and tigers are literally seeking to devour them. The difficulty with this, and I know I'm sure there's a number of you, especially hunters here, who have had that experience where there may, you just have that feeling that there's a mountain lion out there someplace or a grizzly or something, but I think it kind of gets lost. We really, we've been, you know, we're so safe. Life is so good here. There's no... There's nothing out there seeking to devour us. But maybe if I give a little more modern twist to it, maybe as we get only like a, a hundred or so years away, the Lions of Savo is this in, in incredibly difficult story back in the 1890s where these two lions decided to work as a team and they had tasted human blood and they became literal man-eaters, man-stalkers, looking for men to devour. They believe that up to 135 people were killed, that's not talking about the wounded, by these particular lions that were finally eradicated. Or even closer to home. I'm sure, since we're in Montana, most of you are familiar with the Night of the Grizzlies, this horrific 24-hour period in Grizzly National Park in 1967 where two different groups on either side of a mountain were attacked by two different grizzlies. It has never happened since. People still don't know how could such a coincidence happen because 
there are really not a lot of grizzly attacks in the lower 48, but people died in each of those instances. Whenever I go to Glacier, I have the, my hair goes on end sometimes because I just wonder, I just heard a branch snap back there. Satan is hungry and active, and Peter knows that at some times our pride will make us vulnerable. So he says in the strongest of terms, resist him firm in your faith. And here's the thing. We know we can resist Satan and temptation because Jesus did it. No, yeah, you're going to probably argue, no, Jesus is supernatural. He's the son of God. Jesus did it through reading scripture back to Satan. You can resist temptation. So the danger to the Christian is not that we are helpless against the devil. It is that we will not resist the devil. Because throughout Scripture, he isn't always a roaring lion. He, he was a serpent, a snake in Genesis. Maybe you're not too happy with snakes either. But he even disguises himself as light, as something good. When he is with Jesus in the temptation, he quotes Scripture to Jesus, the Son of God. Satan is not someone to be messed with. He is someone to resist. And because of our world, until Christ returns, the battle between good and evil will persist, and suffering for faith in Christ will be the norm of the Christian calling. So, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by the brotherhood throughout the world. And I would add on to that in 2022, and even more so, in the brotherhood throughout our world. Verse 10. And after you have suffered a little while, and that's the second time he's mentioned that, and, you know, that kind of makes us feel great unless you've been suffering for years and years and years because of death, cancer, tragedy, physical illness, whatever it may be. But in the whole perspective of eternity, Peter is reminding us that, yes, this may seem long at times on earth as we suffer, but in the scheme of things, living in eternity with the King Christ, it is a little while. And Peter's given us all these tools for the last four chapters of how we can endure that difficulty that at times may seem like it's not a little while. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Men. And so, as reminders, and Peter's used this language throughout the four and a half chapters so far, he says, just remember, you will be restored. You will be lifted up. You will be exalted. Yes, you are going to go through difficulty, and let's be honest, cancer may get you, a car wreck may get you, but if you are a follower of Christ, you will be restored, maybe not here, but in the life to come, for sure. And he is confirming that you are his. Scripture, throughout Paul's letters, talks about the down payment, the seal, that we are his. And we constantly need those reminders because we are, at times, failures in the way that we lead our lives. Because we are flawed, we are sinful, but God continues to confirm that he loves us and that Jesus Christ sacrificed for us and his blood confirms that we are forgiven. And then he gives us strength. Strength is something that's come throughout this, these chapters, that we will be strengthened, we will be encouraged, whether it's by others, whether it's by scripture, whether it's through our times in prayer, or whether it's just God will just pick us up and carry us through but he will. And then lastly, he will establish us. We will be secure. He already talked about this spiritual house that he was building with Jesus as the cornerstone, the firm foundation. We talked about that today, Randy, with Psalm 40. It's the perfect psalm to go along with this. He has established us as his people, his church, 
the way that he is going to impact the world is through his people. And then don't let this word that we probably don't use a lot kind of just fade away, but think what the word dominion would mean to this audience. Living in Roman society, who has gained peace through strength, through violence, who has been in power for hundreds of years, and if you are a citizen of Rome around this century that these people existed in, there is no light at the end of the tunnel in your mind. There is no way that you can see Rome falling. So that word dominion means a lot to them, and so Peter reminds them, all right, here's the deal. Rome may have dominion now, and they're actually going to have it for another 450 years or so, but there is an ultimate dominion and power that lasts forever. That is what you need to focus on. And then he provides some quick closing comments, and most people believe that this Silvinius is actually Silas, who's in the book of Acts, who's a good friend and missionary with Paul. And so more than likely, this Silas has taken this letter as he did the letter from Jerusalem, and he's delivering that. Peter is unable to move from where he currently is, especially if it's in Rome, but he does have a messenger who can do that for him. And then he says, these are my final exhortations. I've declared to you the grace of God, the grace that allows me, a flawed individual, to be called a son of God, a brother to Christ. So stand firm in it once again. Stand firm in that living hope that is there. And then he references she who is able. This is probably the church in Rome. Babylon is often used to refer to a very negative society. It's language of the exile when the Israelites were taken to Babylon after they had been taken to Assyria as slaves. And so the church in Rome also greets you, as does John Mark, the author of the book of Mark. And then greet one another, and he uses kiss of love. Paul would often say, um, greet each other with a holy kiss. And then finally, just as he began his letter, peace to all of you who are in Christ, he ends his letter. That peace, although seemingly unattainable at times in this fallen world, is something that has been guaranteed to us as followers of Jesus Christ. And so those are Peter's final words, and these are my final thoughts as we wrap up this incredible letter. Clothe yourselves, all of you, in humility. Don't allow pride to get the victory. I mean, there may be things that happen at this church that you don't agree with, things that you may have to step aside and allow to happen, but sometimes we're called to do that, to be humble. And then, going back to chapter 1, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Remember that. We really emphasized that early on. It's not something, to me, it's difficult to think of myself as holy. But according to Scripture, in multiple places, Peter reminds us, I am holy. I am righteous because of the blood of Christ. Because God is holy and I am his. And then lastly, stand firm. Mentioned multiple times, stand firm in your suffering, stand firm in your witness, stand firm in your testimony, stand firm because God allows us, helps us to stand firm. Now, you're going to think I'm really nuts, but you need to have the dashboard hula girl firmness. I know, strange illustration, but think about it. You put that hula girl on your dashboard and it may sway, it may move, Satan may attack, suffering may happen, things may not go right, 
But that foundation never wavers or moves. Because our foundation is built on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as, once again, back to the early verses of 1 Peter. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We who are believers can stand firm. We have a living hope. But if you are not a Christ follower yet, be reminded that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, walked among us in order that God could continue the process of renewing this earth back to its original glory where man and woman could walk innocently together in perfect relationship with God, with no sin, with no pain, with no suffering. And Jesus came and suffered horrifically, emotionally, mentally, physically, and even spiritually. Died on a cross, was raised to life on the third day, and that's what we're going to celebrate at Easter, but we celebrate it every single day. Because without the work of Jesus Christ, his willingness to do what needed to be done, we may have a relationship with God, an eternal relationship with God, a confirmed, a strengthened relationship with God. Jesus is the king, he is on the throne, he has dominion, and we are moving towards that complete fulfillment of that dominion at some time. Jesus will be coming again. Aaron? Please stand with me and we'll sing, I think, another song that drives home sort of the comprehensive idea of humility towards the Lord. Take my life and let it be. And then after this song, Alan will lead us in a closing prayer. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and 